And this week, uh, Rod, Scott, and I got together, and we were just discussion, discussing um, teaching ideas and, and the flow of the Spirit. And, um, you know, we, we want to be able to come and be deliberately obedient with whatever the Holy Spirit is leading us to do and teach and say. Because ultimately, it can't be about us standing up here. It just can't. It can't be just our, our thoughts and our, our, our own feelings and opinions about things. It can't be about that. If it's about that, you guys are wasting your time, you know? Because me personally, if I'm trying to do something out of my own strength um, or my own knowledge, it's, it's just not going to be worth it. Not for you guys. It's got to be spirit-led. And um, with teaching comes a, a lot of responsibility. And even the Word tells us that you shouldn't want to be a teacher because you get held um, accountable so much more. And so we don't take this lightly at all at all by any means, and I don't want you guys to, uh, to take it lightly either. Deliberate obedience. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray through your Holy Spirit, you will give us the strength to be deliberately obedient. Amen. So, I have a very strong feeling that I'm probably not going to stay on my notes much this morning. And my wife was like, you got to be kidding me. She knows what happens whenever I don't stay on my notes. <laughs> I will do my very best to keep it understandable. First, I like to... I like to define or bring out the definition of whatever subject it is that we're teaching on. Because whenever I go to put a, a message together, I ask God, I ask Him to show me through His Spirit what He wants me to speak on. And I felt like uh, He said obedience. And sometimes whenever you're reading through the Word and you're studying things, something will just jump out and smack you right in the face. And I love it whenever it happens, because then I go straight to my wife, and I'm like, hey, babe, check this out. And she's like, here we go again. <laughs> but deliberate obedience. So I've, I've got a couple of uh, messages, a couple of stories to tell you that will tie all of this together. But deliberate means done consciously and intentionally. To do something deliberately, you do it consciously and intentionally. It's not something that you just, eh, you, you just did it. You take time, and you do it on purpose. I tell my kids, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Don't just halfway do it. Do it deliberately. Whatever you're doing, do it deliberately. It was, its origin is Latin, and the D in it means down, and libra means scales or weight. So to weigh it down, to, to literally put it on a scale and determine if it's worth you doing or not. And if it is, do it. Obedience. Compliance with an order, request, or law. Or submission to another's authority. We've talked about that a little bit here in the past. But obedience is desperately important when you want to be in the favor of someone, especially if you are under their authority. For you to be obedient means that there will be blessing from that. If you are disobedient, there's going to be consequences for that, right? It's just, it's the way that, that it's supposed to be. But obedience... Deliberate obedience. All right, so 
Why would we deliberately obey the Word of God? And I'm, I'm legitimately asking every single one of you in here to truly think about why would you deliberately obey the Word of God? Why are you sitting here? You're sitting in here because God has drawn you. The Word says that He draws us to Himself. And that, that it's His kindness that leads us to repentance. Because He was kind, which is why we want to follow Him. His Word in John 14, 21. If you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Did you catch that last part of that? I love the last part, but let's jump into the the beginning of it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you don't love him, why would it even matter? You know, just just to do it, to do it? It's not worth it. There's a lot of sacrifice that, that is involved in keeping God's commandments. But I'm not just, whenever I say commandments, and this this phrase in here. He's not just talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about what He speaks to you through His Holy Spirit. What He's speaking to you. He will tell you what He wants you to do. He'll tell you if He has a plan for you. We know that He has a plan for us. But yes, we should absolutely keep His commandments that are written in this work. If we do, there will be blessing that comes along with it. And I have a feeling that one of the other guys will probably get into... The, the blessings of following His commands a little bit deeper, so I'm not going to jump too much into that today, but there's blessings that come along with it. And He says, if you, if you love Me, you'll keep My commandments, and then My Father will love you. He goes on to say, and I will love whoever that keeps My commandments, if you love Me. I will love you and reveal Myself to you. We all want to know God more. We want to know His characteristics. We want to know what drives Him, what what He sees in us. We want to know what He wants us to do, right? We all have the question, God, why did you make me? What do you have me? What do you have me here for? What do you want me to do? God isn't speaking to me. He says right here that He will reveal Himself to us if we love Him and we keep His commandments. There's a lot of things that that God has asked me to do throughout the years that just scare me to death. And there's been several things that he's told me to do or asked me to do that I haven't done. And and it's devastating. But what I've found is whenever he asks me to do something, and it generally involves speaking to a stranger and telling them something or asking them something or giving them something, I don't know, whatever, it scares me to death. But whenever I do it, the blessings that come from that are amazing. The feeling that he, that he pours out is amazing. And what I found is the more that I do it, the more He talks to me. The more He reveals Himself to me and His purposes and His plans for me. The more that I'm obedient, the more He gives me. It's awesome. It's so awesome. So, the more that you want to hear God, be deliberate in your obedience to Him. I want to tell you about King David. And this is one of those stories that like jumped out at me. Even in the face of extreme adversity, extreme adversity like we've never seen. I can I don't know everybody's personal story in here, but I'm pretty sure they've never gone through what David is about to go through here. I'm going to kind of set the stage for you. So This is while King Saul is still alive. And King Saul is hunting David because he knows David's going to be king. He can't stand David, right? He's tried to pin him to the wall with a spear a couple times. (laughs) uh, in, In my mind, 
I, I can kind of picture that because when I was in the Marine Corps in boot camp, this dude was supposed to be like standing by my lights. You know, we got drill instructors. They're telling you exactly what to do, and we're getting ready to go to bed. Like everybody's in what we call the rack. We're all laying there, but we've got one recruit that, that has to start out with fire watch at night. And he says, stand by my lights. And when, when they give that command, the recruit's standing there, and they're supposed to stick their arm out. And then he says, lights, boom, and you shut them all off at once. Well, this drill instructor was especially good at his job. And, and he says, stand by my lights, and this recruit goes, click, and shuts them off before he says lights. And everybody else goes, uh-oh. We didn't say it, but we thought it. And this drill instructor starts screaming. You see the uh, flags over here? Well, we had these flags. They're called guide-ons. And they're on a flag post, and they've got a pike on the end of it. And it's sticking in this uh, concrete base right next to one of the beds, the, the guide's bed, because he's the one that carries the guide-on. He leads the, the platoon of recruits. This drill instructor goes over, grabs this guide on out of there, and whoo, chucks it at this dude. I mean, just barely misses him. It goes, ping, we hear it just ping off the wall. I'm like, what? But whenever I'm reading this about King Saul, and he's trying to pin David to a wall with his spear, it always reminds me of senior drill instructor Sergeant Varanus. Don't tell him I said that. He is... He's still, just the thought of him kind of scares me a little bit. You know, it's like, still, is he around? <laughs> but uh, awesome dude. I love him to death. But so David is running for his life because King Saul has the entire Israeli army behind him, all of them. But what King David has is God, for one, and he listens to God. He loves God. This is after David was a young boy and killed Goliath, chopped his head off and took it around with him. So he's running around with his 16, or 600 mighty men and they're trying to avoid going into battle with the Israelite army. And he goes and he lives. He decides that it would be a great idea to go into the land of the Philistines. Well, Goliath, that he chopped his head off, was a Philistine. Everybody remember that? David decides to go live in the land of the Philistines to get away from Saul. He's like, he's not going to follow me here. And he was right. He didn't follow him there. But he's living in this town called Ziklag. And the king there is named King Achish. And David creates this friendship with King Achish. And King Achish believes that, that David's on his side. Like he's... He's infiltrated right into their ranks. Like, they're getting ready to go to war against the Israelites, and King Achish is taking David with him. David's killed so many Philistines at this point. It's just mind-blowing. And in fact, while he was living in Ziklag, he would go out and he would raid all of these other villages and kill everybody and burn it and take all their stuff. Right there under their noses, they had no idea that he was doing it. He'd tell them, oh, I was, out, I was out raiding the other Israelite tribes, you know. And so he totally had them, had them bluffed, right? So then they're getting ready to go into war against the Israelites. And David is in the back with his 600 mighty men. And if you've ever read anything about his mighty men, they were the baddest of the bad. There's nobody as bad as these dudes. Literally nobody living today could stand a chance against any of them, guaranteed. So they're back there, and all of a sudden, the Philistine leaders realize that Achish is bringing David with his 600 men into battle with us in the rear. Well, what do you think's going to happen, king? He goes, they said, he can't come with us. And King Achish is like, he's been living with me for over a year, man. Like, I trust this guy. And they said, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So King Achish is like, okay, I'll tell him to go back home. So he tells him to go back home, and David's like, I was going to show you what I could do in battle. 
And he's like, I know, I know, but they don't want you to come, so I need you and your servants of God to go back. King Achish, a Philistine king, is calling King David's mighty men servants of God. He recognizes that they're servants of the Most High God. Isn't that awesome? Super cool. So, something that I love about David is he's still obedient. He submitted to even the authority of King Achish, which was not his, his authority from God's structure. Saul was his authority from God's structure, and we know that he recognized that, but he was living in King Achish's land, and he was obedient to King Achish even. He even submitted to him deliberately. He was going to battle. I don't know. If he got to go into battle, I have a feeling David would have slaughtered all of them just because that was what David did. He was so, so awesome of a warrior. But nevertheless, he submits, and he goes back to Ziklag. It says he got up early the next morning and went back because King Achish told him to get up early the next morning and go back. So he did. Something very interesting happened, though, while David and his men were on the way to go fight in this war. Ziklag got plundered by the Amalekites. And all the mighty men and David were gone. So the Amalekites, they seize this opportunity. They go in and they kidnap all the, all the women, the children. It says young, old, it didn't matter. Man, woman, child, it didn't matter. They kidnapped all of them. They took them captive and all of their livestock, drove them out of the city and burned the city. They burned King David's town. This is a bad move. But where was King David going? He was going on his way to war. But while this was happening, Achish sends him back home. They get back home. They were three days away from home. They get back home. And whenever they show up, they realize that this, that this, was taking, that this had taken place. And they are all distraught. Horribly distraught. So... I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you where we were at. We're in 1 Samuel. Um, them going into battle is in verse uh, chapter 29, but whenever they get back home is chapter 30. If you want to follow along and read through that, you, you can. I'm paraphrasing a bunch. I'm getting ready to start reading the actual text here shortly, though, because it's super important. So, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. They were, this is after they were sent back. It says, Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had carried out an attack on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. It also talks about them um, uh, overthrowing a few other towns, but that's not real important to the story right now. It is important, but not to what I'm teaching on. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, from the small to the great, without killing anyone, and drove them off and went their way. That's very important that we understand that they didn't kill any of them. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. I can't imagine that feeling that had to be going through the pit of his stomach. He had done this to multiple Towns, but now it came back and happened to him. Now he's, he's feeling what lots of other people had felt at this point in time. He's feeling this. He's, he's, he and all of his mighty men that are, that are battle-hardened warriors have now lost their wives, their families. Everything that they owned is now gone. But they, what were they doing? They were going to war, supposedly against the Israelites, with the Philistine armies. Not a good idea. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until there was no more strength in them to weep. Of course they did. But think about this. What we don't understand is they were prepared to go to battle. They had been carrying their weapons. 
They had gone at least three days out, but they probably went and met up with the king. So they've been marching, marching for several days, over a week. They were already tired, but then they get back home. They get back home and everything's gone, and they weep. All of them weep. All of them had lost everything. They weep until there's no strength in them left to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken captive. This is, this is something that's, that's really important. They're, they want to get across the point that David's wives were taken. He loved his wives, absolutely loved them. But then it says, he was in great distress because the people spoke of stoning him for all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David felt strengthened in the Lord his God. So, so David, David's dealing with something a little bit different than everybody else. David's the leader here. David is the one that was leading them to the battle that took them away from their home. And now they've lost everything. So they're not just angry and upset that they lost everything. They're angry and upset at David because he led them to do this. David is struggling because he didn't just lose everything. He led them and he caused them to lose their families too. And now they want to kill him. So he's struggling with losing everything struggling that he was the leader that made them lose everything, and he's struggling because his best friends want to stone him to death. What would be your very first reaction? I can tell you what mine would be. Let's go, boys. We're going to go get them back. We're going to find them, and we're going to slaughter everybody that tried taking them. That would be my first reaction. That's not David's first reaction. Mind-blowing Mind-blowing. Everybody that I've talked to about this, everybody that I've asked, their minds are just blown that that was not his first reaction. The Word says that David was a man after God's own heart, and he proves it time and time again, but he really proves it here. It, it hits home right here. It says, but David felt strengthened in the Lord his God. Why did he feel strengthened in the Lord his God, though? Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of uh, Ahimelech, please bring me the ephod. He was even polite about it. He said, please bring me the ephod. The ephod is what they put on whenever they are, whenever they are praying to God. It was part of their tradition to put this ephod on, to pray to God, and they would hear from the Lord. He, his first reaction isn't, let's go get him. His first reaction is, priest, Bring me the ephod. He brings him the ephod. This had to just absolutely enrage the guys. It had to have. They, they are under submission of this man that caused this, and now he's saying, you will wait. We will wait until I ask God if he wants us to go get them. Oh, my gosh. This is insane. He's saying this, King David is bad to the bone, but he has 600 of the most fierce warriors in the world wanting to stone him, and he's saying, you will wait. And they waited. This is so awesome. He says, please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. He's like, you bet, I'm going to get it, because his family was probably gone too. And then it goes on. In verse 8, it says, And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band of raiders? Will I overtake them? He asked God, God, do you want me to go after them? Or do you not want me to go after them? I will be obedient in whichever you answer. I don't know about you guys. I've, ever since this started to sink in, I've been praying, God, please help me to understand to be that obedient. Help me in my obedience. Help me to be deliberately obedient 
that even if the worst of the worst could possibly happen. I have three daughters. The worst of the worst is not them dying. The worst of the worst is them being kidnapped and me not knowing where they are. That would be the worst torture that anyone could possibly do to me. I can, I can withstand a whole lot. I know because I've withstood a whole lot. I don't know how I would physically be able to, to bear up to that. And his family was kidnapped. And he didn't know where they were. And all of their families were. And they didn't know where they were. And his first response is, God, do you want me to go find them or not? Because I'm going to be obedient in whatever it is that you want me to do. Life or death, not only my own, but also my family's, whatever could possibly be happening to them, I'm still submitting this to you. I, guys, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. Absolute deliberate obedience. But here's what I love. Here's why David could be deliberately obedient no matter what. No matter what, this is why he can be deliberately obedient. He has experienced God work in his life, work miracles in his life, save his life, keep him from death, protect him, watch over him, care for him. He knows that he is a loving father. He knows that he is a loving and caring God that wants nothing but the absolute very best for him. And that's why he can do this. That's why he can put his faith in God. And God does it again. He says, and he said to him, and God, capital H, he said to him, Pursue, for you will certainly overtake them, and you will certainly rescue everyone. God tells him, you're going to go, and you're going to rescue everyone. So let's read on. So David pursued, and he and 400 men, he took 400 because 200 of the most fierce warriors in the world were so exhausted that they could not go. So he took the 400 that were, had enough strength to at least get to the battle. He took these 400 men and moving forward, as they are going, as they're following the tracks, they run into this Egyptian. This Egyptian was a slave to one of the Amalekites. They run into this dude. He hadn't eaten or drank anything for three days. He's absolutely exhausted, um, starving of, of food and, and water. And they run into him, and they ask him who he is, where did he come from. He answers and says who he is, and he, he tells them that they had been on this raiding party, that they had wiped out a bunch of towns. It wasn't just David's, but that they took everybody from Ziklag, all of them, took everybody. So David's like, great, can you tell me where this place is? The man made a very good choice here in saying yes. Because if he, <laughs> we all know what would have happened if he said no. So he tells him yes, and he takes him down there. He gives David some stipulations, and David says, sure, I'll follow those. They give the dude food and water and everything. So the man says, we carried out an attack on the Negev and all these different places, we burned Ziklag with fire. Whenever this guy's telling this story, he's saying we. David, you, you have to think, David's probably, his blood's boiling, and he probably has to keep these guys from, from just killing him, you know, um, because he was involved. He says we. But anyhow, then David said to him, will you bring me down to the band of raiders? Now when he brought him down, behold, they were dispersed over all the land, eating and drinking and celebrating because of all the great plunder that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. The Philistines and the land of Judah. If you all remember, Judah is an Israel tribe, an Israeli tribe. Um, and God doesn't stand for that. He doesn't take lightly to it. But they're all celebrating. They know the Philistines and everybody's off to war. So we're going to come in and we're going to capitalize on this moment. And so they're celebrating. Their guard is down. 
But little does he know, the most fierce warrior to ever live is watching them celebrate with his family. So he rains down judgment on them. It says, David slaughtered them from the twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except for 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So you got to think, how big was this army if they, if they said he slaughtered everybody for all day, all day? And only 400 of them got away. How many did David come with? 400. The 400 of God's appointed, of the ones that God had raised up. In Psalms 144.1, it says, Praise be to God, my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war. God trained these men to, to be warriors. He trained them to do this, and they were very, very good at it. So, 400 of them wiped out everybody except for 400 young men, probably really young men, that jumped on some camels and beat feet. That was the best choice they could possibly make. So, they get out, but then check this out. 1 Samuel 30, verse 18, it says, So David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, son or daughter, plunder or anything that they had taken for themselves. David brought it all back. So what did God say? He said, go and you will recover everything. He was obedient. God said, because of your obedience, I'm going to give you everything back. And he gets it all back. It says right here, he gets it all back. That's amazing. But think, think about that, though. He was, he was going into battle. And if he would have chose to argue with the king and still go with him, where would his family be? How much longer would his family have been with the Amalekites? If he wouldn't have been obedient, his family would have suffered. Their families would have suffered. It would have been that much longer. He was already several days away. So God, God used someone else to tell David to go do what he, he needed to do, and David was obedient. Therefore, he got everything back. It's an amazing story. So... That's why whenever I started this out, I said, in, in the face of extreme adversity, he was still obedient. Still obedient. And that's why. So, Abraham Clark. This isn't in the Bible. This is American history. But it's an interesting story, and I wanted to bring it up. <clears throat> Abraham Clark was born in 1726. He was also an American lawyer or attorney, and he was a delegate of the Continental Congress and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a born-again Christian as well. But during the war, Abraham Clark's two sons, they were taken captive. They were prisoners of war, and they were held in absolutely horrible, horrible condition. They were tortured in terrible ways, and one starved only eating what his fellow inmates could squeeze through <clears throat> could squeeze through the keyhole of his cell his health suffered and he did die at a very young age but the british offered something to abraham they offered him a deal they said if he would re recant his signing of the declaration of independence and proclaim loyalty to the king that they would release his kids, his sons. They knew they were his, his sons, and they told him, if you will recant and you will remove your name from that and swear loyalty to the king, we will give your sons back. And he knew the kind of torture that they were going through. Even with his sons' lives at stake, Abraham would not agree he didn't feel that men in power should use their positions for their own personal gain, so he didn't even tell his fellow members in Congress that his sons had been captured until he learned that they were aboard the HMS Jersey, which was notorious for the bad treatment of war prisoners. 
Now, his sons, they were eventually released at the end of the war um, during a prisoner exchange. But his, his obedience here, this story doesn't completely outline his faith and his trust in God because the only way that he had his faith and his trust to be able to not give in and get his kids back was through the power of God, was through, was through Jesus helping him. That was it. Fortunately, he hung, he hung tight. Now, another example, the best example, the greatest example that I could possibly give you of deliberate, deliberate obedience is when our Lord and Savior Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying to his Father. He knew what had to be done. He knew that a sacrifice absolutely had to be made, that there was no way that we could have a relationship with him without this sacrifice. And we know throughout the Word, it says time and time again, that he made statements, he said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. He was obedient. He had deliberate obedience in everything, even so much so that whenever he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that he's getting ready to be hung on a cross, knowing that he's getting ready to be tortured, tormented, beaten, it wasn't just a quick death. David would probably have died a fairly quick death with a sword or an arrow or something like that, a spear. Jesus knew what lied ahead for him. He knew it. He knew what the Father had commanded for him to do. And he said, if you can take this from me, take this from me. But if not, your will be done and not mine. I will be deliberately obedient and I will follow through with what you asked me to do. And he did. He followed through with it. It's that's just amazing. But look at the benefit that comes out of his decision to be deliberately obedient. We get eternal life with him. We get to spend eternity with him. We get to be in heaven with him, given crowns. We get to rule and reign with him, which otherwise would not be possible. But because of his deliberate obedience and what he asks, is that we be deliberately obedient as well. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you do this, you love me, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to reveal myself to you. That's what he does. That's the gift that we get for being obedient. We get to spend eternity with him. The wages of sin is death. What death is, is separation from God. Is ultimate separation from him. But when when he did this, and he says, when, when you love me, you're going to get to be with me forever. This is crazy exciting. It's crazy exciting. And we get to serve together. We get to do this together. We get to be obedient together. Scott, what was that verse yesterday? Acts? I think it is Acts chapter 2, verse 1. But Jesus began to do and teach. That's one of the reasons I love being in this team because whenever it's not clicking up here, I get to go, hey, Scott, what's this? Or hey, Rod, what's this? Jesus began to do and teach. But what did he do first? He began to do first. Do you remember Jesus didn't start out his ministry teaching everybody. He began to do. He went to John the baptizer. baptizer. He got baptized. He got baptized. And the Holy Spirit descended and rested on him. Remained on him, the Word says. He began to do. And then he began to teach. And that's what we get to do. We get to, we get to be deliberately obedient to whatever he's telling us to do, we find what he tells us in here 
But then we also have to be obedient to the fivefold gifts of the Spirit and do what He leads us to do and tells us to do. It's amazing. We get to do this together. We get to enter into this journey together. I love it. I love it, guys. So, what I'm asking you today is, what is God calling you to be obedient with today? Take a minute and think about it. What has God asked you to do? And I'm telling you, if He's asking you to do something, it's going to be greater than you can accomplish on your own. It'll be greater than you can accomplish on your own. Therefore, Satan's going to try to instill fear into you to where being deliberately obedient will be a challenge. But he says that you can overcome. That you can overcome because he will help you. He will send the Holy Spirit, the helper, to help you. You can overcome whatever the challenges are. You can overcome the fear that Satan's trying to put on you because he doesn't want you to accomplish what God is telling you to be obedient to. He doesn't want you to be obedient. He wants to steal that from you. But not just from you, from whoever else would be blessed by what God is asking you to do. He's not asking you to do something that's only going to bless you. When you're obedient, it's going to bless everybody else that's involved. It's going to reach people that you will have no idea that it reaches until you get to heaven and God reveals it to you. He says, here's your crown for being obedient here. And you're like, whoa, I didn't even realize that. Satan does not want you to accomplish these things. That's why it takes deliberate obedience. Consciously and intentionally being obedient to what he's telling you to do. If you feel like, man, my life is bland. I just feel like I don't have a purpose. My friends, ask God what that purpose is. And whenever he tells you, even if it's scary, do it. If it's so scary that you're not wanting to do it, come to me. Come to, come to any of the elders, the leadership team, Rod, Scott, all of it. Come to us. We will come alongside you, we will encourage you, we will help you, and we will together accomplish what God has set in your heart to do. But guys, the time of being stagnant and being disobedient is over. It's got to be over. We have to demand that it's over. If you want to see change, be the change. Be the change. That's what we are all going to collectively do. We will be the change together. You want to see this city taken? Let's take this city. You want to see this state or this nation taken? Let's take the state. Let's take the nation. Step out. David said, do you want me to go? And God said, yes. And it's going to be a fierce battle. He didn't say go, and I'm going to hand them over to you without any warfare. They battled for over a day, and some of them were so exhausted that they couldn't even go to the battle. He didn't say it's going to be simple. He said, you're going to fight. I promise you, if you decide to be obedient, there's going to be a fight. But you're not alone. We're in it with you. Today, there's going to be a baptism afterwards. I absolutely love baptisms. Don't I, Cheyenne? <laughs> I love baptisms because it is being obedient to what God called us to do. And there's power in that. There's power in it. He says that He will come and make His home in us. Whenever we, we acknowledge Him in front of men, He will acknowledge us to the Father. And this, this is that act. It is going down. It is coming up new. It is power giving. I've watched several lives totally changed when they were obedient to baptism. When they were obedient to take that step. It takes you to another level. God has level upon level upon level upon level. Stuff that we don't understand. 
that we don't even understand yet. Scott and I were talking the other day, and he was blowing my mind with these, with the different levels that God, that God lays out in his word that he takes us to, that he wants to take us to. There are levels that he clearly defines that you will get to. We all want to jump right up here to this level, right? We want to get there overnight. We're not going to get there overnight. It takes steps. It's a process. But that's okay. This, this step, going from, from not being baptized to being baptized, is amazing. And then you get, that, you get that energy and you get that rush of the Holy Spirit that helps you so much to be obedient. So then we're obedient, and God just pours out even more onto us. It's amazing. It's so amazing. So anyway, I'm so proud of you for getting ready to get baptized. That's awesome, man. Your life is about to change again. So be ready for it. We're going to go ahead and wrap up, but if anybody has anything that they want prayer for, um, feel free to come and get prayer. Come grab us. You know what's interesting is the Word tells us that we're struggling. If we struggle with uh, an illness, if we need healing, the Word says, to come and get the elders of the church, to have them anoint you with oil and pray for you, and you will be healed, is what it says. It doesn't say if you come and get them, if you're obedient to take that step and they anoint you with oil and pray over you, you might be healed. It says you will be healed. So if you need healing, come up. We're not going to dump the whole thing on you. But even if we did, it's not that much. You know? It'd run right off my head. Myra? <laughs> None of the ladies want to get oil in their hair, you know what I mean? I'm not worried about that. It could run down the beard, right? The Word talks about running down the beard. But seriously, if you need healed for anything, come up. Let us pray for you to be healed. You're not going to see God move if you don't take the step of obedience and let Him move. If nothing happens, you guarantee what will happen. If you refuse to act, what will happen is nothing. That's what will happen. God moves with your obedience. Be obedient. Let's play that music. Come on up if you need anything.